My name is Xue Lei, Associate Professor of Art History at Oregon State University. This is a short introduction to my book, Eulogy for Bayonne Crane and the Art of Chinese Calligraphy, published by University of Washington Press in December 2019. Eulogy for Bayonne Crane is one of the most mysterious artifacts from ancient China and an unlikely canon of Chinese calligraphy. Its story reveals a broad range of practice that may be called visual cultural writing, including calligraphy, of course, the most revered art in traditional China. Today, the inscription is housed in the on-site museum in five fragments pieced together and mounted on the fiberglass wall. Originally, it was carved at the natural cliff at the bottom of Jiao Shan an island in the middle of Yangtze River, near today's Zhenjiang, Jiangsu province. Scholars have come up with all kinds of theories about its date and author. Most people now believe it was created in the 6th century. In fact, it would be such a bizarre thing for any time period. The only known tombstone for a bird, as far as I know. And more importantly, it's real. By which I mean it's not just a eulogy, a piece of writing, a literary expression. You can see it in person, and you can touch it, if you're allowed. And when you admire its large size, imagine you are in its original location. You cannot miss the magnificent landscape behind you, as this 16th century painting shows. The size, the placement, and the landscape all together conjure up a symbolic tumulus, a funerary monument. But for who? The crane is a metaphor, of course. It's a well-known symbol of immortality in Taoist culture, the vehicle of deities in the deathless world. But what about its death? This irony prompts us to the imagery of crane in early medieval literature, in which the bird has often been associated with political discontent. Based on this new reading and the early 6th century history, I suggest that the eulogy must be created by a local Taoist community to lament their loss and the suffering during the imperial persecution of the religion at the moment. The rest of the book is about the stone's afterlife as a calligraphy model. The stone has not been mentioned until the 11th century, when its fragments were rediscovered in water, badly damaged and eroded. But the one man saw this stone in a very different way, calling it a great masterpiece of calligraphy. He is Huang Tianjian, one of the most prominent poet and calligrapher in Chinese history. Furthermore, he incorporated into his avant-garde style that the people never seen before. Just look at the individual strokes. They're stretching, trembling, piercing, intertwining, full of animation and momentum. To explain Huang Tianjian's calligraphy drama, I try to focus on one question, which seems simple but essential to him and his contemporaries. How to write a bigger calligraphy? and to make it at once spectacular and personal. And be ready to perform it in the literati party like the painting shows. It was in this culture milieu for the first time the eulogy entered the history of calligraphy. A few centuries later, Dong Qichang, another master scholar calligrapher, attempted to decode the secret of big writing again. Like Wang Tingjian, he spent much time on studying the eulogy. Or more accurately in this case, the rubbing of the eulogy and the recreating an odd effect in his own work. It would take another hour to explain Dong Qichang's awkward brushwork, but let's look at the other side of the story, the rubbing he studied. It's not from the stone, it's a faked one, published in the calligraphy model book or Fa Tie in Chinese. Fatie reproduced historical works in rubbing form and compiled as an album or book. It has a long history, 
However, in Dong Chichang's time, it gained a new life, becoming the game changer in disseminating and shaping the visual knowledge of calligraphy, like what was happening in other popular visual media in the booming commercial publication in the later 16th century. These model books were sold in the specialized store in the busy street market, aiming at the new reading public. So this is the one unexpected finding of my research. It was the faked rubbing and the mass market that made the eulogy a canon of Chinese calligraphy. Also thanks to the same market, popular woodblock prints like this made the stone in the island even more famous. People came all the way to Jiaoshan experiencing the marvelous view and the excitement of searching and touching this mysterious stone in the water. Furthermore, they also left their own stories and had them carved on the rocks on the island. This, one may be called elegant graffiti, starting centuries before, has turned the island itself into not just a subject of writing, but a medium of writing, a site of calligraphy. The last episode of Eulogy for Baron Crane is set in the so-called steady study calligraphy in the turn of the 20th century. Works like this, a transcription of the eulogy and roughly in the latest style, speak to both scholarly taste and the popular sensation about the stone. Ironically, the text is fragmentally like the broken inscription, lack of semantic coherence. As the verbal content is sacrificed for the visual spectacle, the core notion of calligraphy as a writing is fundamentally changed. That's how ancient artifacts like the eulogy were appropriated and adapted to the modern visual world, adorning the antique store's wall in the picture or someone's living room in the Shanghai apartment building. All these dimensions I brought into the book are meant to demystify the stone and its history. I have to confess, however, it will always remain a big mystery to me. Every time back to the island, standing in front of the stone, I feel the same as my first visit. It's real and it's surreal. Thank you for watching the video.